Alien sightings, one of the most controversial topics and the result of much speculation and theories over the last decades. Thousands of people around the world, sometimes even people we know, claim to have seen something impossible, something that left them in disbelief, something so incredible as to make them doubt their own eyes. Something that seems not to belong to our world, unidentified flying objects. The boldest of these quickly grabbed their smartphones and their cameras, stealing shots of these phenomena as if they were so incredulous as to want tangible proof of what they themselves saw. But it cannot be denied that among these people there are also charlatans, characters with delusions of protagonism, or sometimes even people who are simply not aware of the natural explanation of the meteorological phenomenon they have witnessed. Skeptics hastily dismiss any evidence or facts presented to them, relying precisely on these bogus testimonies. For these skeptics, there is always a reason or explanation that they may not even be aware of firsthand, as long as it doesn't involve intelligent life forms unknown to humans. They seem confident as they answer in chorus no to the question of whether there are other intelligent life forms in the universe. However, there are some events that cannot be overlooked, events so sensational that not even governments have been able to ignore them. Events that even the most knowledgeable experts on the subject have not been able to give a rational explanation for. Mass Alien Sightings what happens if the unidentified object inhabiting the skies, instead of being seen by a single person, is seen by tens, hundreds, thousands, or even tens of thousands of people? The witness accounts of sightings of unidentified flying objects date back to the mists of time. People have always told stories of encounters with strange and mysterious beings from other worlds. The first official reports of UFO sightings were recorded in the 20th century, but sightings are likely to have been much more frequent in human history. There are several documented cases where people have seen massive formations of UFOs, usually consisting of dozens or even hundreds of flying saucers. In some cases, these are probably collective hallucinations, but in others, they could have been actual sightings of aliens. March the 13th, 1997. Tim Lay and his son Hal are returning home after visiting family friends. It's the evening and it's after eight, their usual dinner time. If they don't hurry to get home, Bobby, Tim's wife, will be angry. Perhaps this is the reason that neither of them has yet realised what is happening right above their heads. The car turns into their driveway and stops. Tim turns off the engine, gets out hurriedly and heads home, his mouth already watering. Hal probably would have done the same, but for some reason he hasn't gotten out of the car yet. He's enchanted, looking at the sky. His father, a little annoyed, follows the direction of his son's gaze, and it is at that moment that he is frozen to the spot. In the starry sky, not far from where they are, a formation of five lights arranged in a triangle advances. A few minutes later, Bobby comes out of the house and joins them, staring into the sky. The three are eyewitnesses of one of the most famous and controversial mass UFO sightings. It is the night of the Phoenix Lights, and like Tim, Hal and Bobby, tens of thousands of people are standing in their driveways, silent, observing the sky and those strange lights. Unnatural lights that capture their full attention. But what happened in Phoenix is just one of the many documented events in which a large group of people witness an inexplicable phenomenon, attributable to intelligent life forms from another planet. Florence October the 27th, 1954. The friendly match between Fiorentina and Pistoiese is being played at the stadium, when a whitish material of unknown origin begins to rain from the sky, baffling the over 10,000 spectators and causing the game to be halted. 
Brussels, March the 30th, 1990. More than 13,000 people witnessed something inexplicable. In the sky above them, four lights of intermittent red, green and yellow that are brighter than the stars flash in a triangular pattern. Perfectly synchronized, they rocket at an estimated speed of 1,050 miles per second, an unbearable speed for humans to then split up and disappear in different directions. These phenomena, like many others, have been so evident and conspicuous that not even the most sceptical have been able to ignore them. In these circumstances, even governments find themselves having to publicly investigate the facts. Professionals and experts of all kinds are called upon to express their opinion or to try to formulate hypotheses and theories. Often the cause of these inexplicable events is attributed to military exercises or meteorological phenomena, until a sufficiently comprehensive explanation is found or public opinion turns to other issues. For example, after the episode in Brussels, the explanation that was given was that the lights were actually helicopters, which seen from a certain angle would have deceived the spectators. There are even those who dismiss the event as a mass hallucination. But something doesn't add up. Tehran, September the 18th, 1976. At 11 p.m., the Iranian Air Force received several reports from the terrified population. Something is flying over their heads. Lieutenant Jafari is on base that evening. He's catching his breath after another hard day's work when he notices that the base is in uproar. General Yousefi, in charge of the base, sends a fighter plane piloted by Captain Aziz Khan to investigate. However, when near the unidentified flying object, the fighter's radio systems stop working and the captain is forced to return to the base. General Yousefi is worried. Did the fighter malfunction or was it that strange aircraft that caused the malfunctioning? He fears they are under attack and needs to clarify the situation. He decides to try again and, this time, Lieutenant Jafari will pilot another fighter plane. Courageous, Jafari has no objections. He takes off and heads towards the objects. As he approaches, the light becomes more and more dazzling, so much so that the pilot cannot distinguish a structure or a shape. However, he notices that the light is intermittent, red, green and orange. Slowly, the objects, four in all, separate from the main one. When Jafari passes any of them, his equipment seems to go crazy, but he keeps a cool head and keeps getting closer. Suddenly, one of the objects shoots towards him, like a missile, as if it were attacking him. Jafari's reaction is quick and effective, as only a veteran's can be. With an evasive manoeuvre, he dodges the object and promptly launches a heat-seeking missile. But the missile doesn't fire. His equipment is out of order. He has to return to base. Meanwhile, one of the four objects lands just outside the capital, radiating beams of intense light. Emergency sirens sound. Chaos reigns. The following day, a helicopter goes to the site where the object landed, but it has disappeared into thin air. This incredible story, if viewed in its entirety, has something even more surprising. If we compare the testimonies describing the object seen by Lieutenant Jafari with those of the object that will appear in Brussels 14 years later, the similarities are striking. But if it is true that in Belgium in 1990, what thousands of people witnessed was not an alien object but a formation of helicopters, how can they have seen the same thing in Tehran in 1976? The question therefore arises, how do you explain the fact that different people, in different parts of the world, in different years, have seen the same type of objects? This is just one of the many coincidences that make mass sightings so important when it comes to ufology. Try as you may to speculate, hypothesize or theorize explanations, the facts are unequivocal. Many, cornered in the face of these conclusions, find the only possible solution to the dilemma in defining these phenomena as mass suggestions.
the psychosocial UFO hypothesis. In practice, it is theorized that these sightings are the result of mass hysteria. Therefore, all the people who witness these events are actually influenced, and therefore their testimony is not reliable. In fact, science has repeatedly demonstrated how the power of the human mind is formidable and capable of doing things we are not even aware of. Mass hallucinations, however rare, have been shown to exist and to have occurred, but always under one condition, external suggestion. That is, if a group of people is convinced that there are UFOs in the sky, it is possible that these objects will be seen, even if they are not present. However, this is exactly where paleo-ufology comes into play. Paleo-ufology is the branch of ufology that studies ufological phenomena in the history, even the most remote, of humanity. Indeed, before the internet, smartphones, television or cinema, there are records of unidentified flying objects in the sky. But if today people can be influenced by the media, the internet or by the stories of others about aliens, the testimonies coming even from ancient Greece cannot be the result of the same suggestion. In the past, the idea that other forms of life could exist in space was not even contemplated. The men of the times, as some still seem to do today, believed that they were at the centre of the universe and that they were the only ones who existed, the favourites of the gods. What these men saw in the sky and reported in the writings that have been left to us cannot be the result of external conditioning. Over 2,000 years ago, in ancient Greece, General Timoleon was called to free Sicily from the tyrant Dionysius the Younger. He is sailing with his fleet. When looking at the sky, he sees something that he cannot understand, something that strikes him so much he feels the need to leave a written record for posterity. In fact, above the Greek fleet, what he calls a torch flies in the clear sky of the Mediterranean Sea. Surely the Greek general had not undergone any kind of suggestion, let alone a religious one, which could make him imagine seeing something in the sky. Here too, many object that everything concerning paleo-ufology, being often testified only by ancient texts or paintings, does not have sufficient details for the phenomenon to be analysed with precision. Without careful analysis, it is impossible to give a rational explanation, and the testimonies of the past are therefore dismissed as unreliable. But if we try to apply the same method to the story of Timoleon that we applied to the testimonies of Tehran and Brussels, we can discover something incredible. Sasselberg, South Africa, November the 18th, 1993. It is 10 p.m. on an ordinary evening when Messieurs Duplessis and Venta observe what appears to be a cigar, irradiated with red and orange light, fluttering madly in the skies above their heads. In 1993, an object that looks like a cigar can easily, in Timoleon's ancient Greece, where cigars didn't exist, look like a torch. Haven Broad, Wales, 1977 the city and its inhabitants are in turmoil. Many claim to have seen something in the skies, among them 14 elementary school children. The children are invited to draw what they have seen, and surprisingly, all the drawings, as well as the witness accounts, match. A cigar-shaped object, which emits flames of all colours. February 1946, Sweden. About 2,000 sightings of unidentified flying objects are reported. The description is always the same. Tapered objects with orange lights in the rear. Witness accounts with frightening similarities to the previous ones. It is very difficult to explain almost identical sightings from all over the world over a time period that varies by almost 2,500 years. What we can certainly exclude is that Timoleon in ancient Greece was influenced by the stories of others and imagined everything. 
In the same way, it is impossible that all the inhabitants of Haven Broad or Sweden who reported and witnessed the phenomenon knew the story of Timoleon. Not only is it a testimony known only to enthusiasts and scholars of ufology, but also, in the years of the sightings, especially in those referring to sightings that took place in Sweden, given the lack of internet, finding that type of information was quite complex and required a dedication to the uncommon ufological cause. So, even taking these events separately, we can deduce that the probability that the witnesses influenced each other borders on the impossible. And even more improbable is the fact that even if they did influence each other in some way, they all imagined the same thing at the same time. It is not about scientific theories to prove or technical knowledge. It's simple logic. How else can such similar events that occurred in such polar opposite situations be explained? The psychosocial theory of UFOs, given the factors already mentioned, becomes increasingly unlikely at this point. Every question remains unanswered, and every attempt at explanation brings only new doubts. The connections between events that have extremely similar characteristics, verified however in completely different situations, years and places, make it impossible to reach a solution in a short time. The only thing possible, to date, seems to be to tackle the subject with study, patience and dedication. An answer, needless to deny it, is currently lacking. However many hypotheses or solutions that can be found, the probability that these are real is certainly much lower than the possibility that in infinite space there are other intelligent life forms, technologically much more developed than we are, that have managed to get in touch with us. The fact remains that with the development of technologies we have reached in contemporary times, mass sightings have become not only a blatant event that cannot be overlooked or disbelieved, but also a fundamental tool for UFO studies. Studies that could lead to results capable of radically changing not only our society, but also the daily lives of each and every one of us. Indeed, by grouping the different types of sightings into categories, common points could be drawn up. Flying objects with a tapered shape, which might look like cigars or torches. Triangles of lights that move in formation. Aircraft brighter than a star that separate into four smaller independent objects, or that project intense multicolored lights, and many more. For different types of sightings, we have more testimonies that come from various parts of the world, which occurred in a period of time much longer than that which led the human race to modern technological development. From paleo-ufology to modern sightings, many events have points in common, even if the witnesses have in no way had the opportunity to confront each other, much less to know about the others, making it impossible to believe that different witnesses can influence each other. These factors alone should be sufficient by themselves to increase the effort that governments should pursue investigating unidentified flying objects and the possibility that other intelligent life forms are present on our planet. But this doesn't happen. Even in the face of obvious facts, nobody organizes effective and official studies. There are many experts who have independently collected information over the years. Prepared and capable people who deserve a chance. Several have dedicated their lives to studying unidentified flying objects and could, with the right tools, find concrete answers to the questions we all ask ourselves in the modern day. Nowadays, Debates regarding the presence or absence of extraterrestrial life forms on our planet are the order of the day. Anyone in their daily life can find themselves facing this type of conversation with the same frequency with which they talk about any other topic. The theme, it can be said with some certainty, is one of the most current and most controversial. 
Often, however, the most skeptical people take sides, rigid in their position, and are not open to constructive dialogue. This happens, probably, also due to official sources which always tend to debunk any theory, at any cost and by any means. When it comes to extraterrestrials, institutions hastily liquidate the theories of ufologists by discrediting them. Is it possible that there is already an answer in the archives of some ministries, but for some reason it is perhaps best kept secret? Not taking events of this magnitude seriously enough to reach the truth would be a grave mistake. Evidence of what goes on in the sky is present everywhere online, as well as in the minds of witnesses. Witnesses who are often retaliated against and mocked. Ufology is one of the most controversial subjects of our times. It almost seems that the world has split in two, the skeptics and the ufologists as if one had to take a rigid stance for life. In reality, it would be enough to delve deeper into the matter to be able to give real and exhaustive answers which would definitively silence any controversy. It is undeniable that the phenomenon of mass sightings with the internet, social networks and smartphones has become uncensorable. But why would anyone want to censor it? After all, we are all involved in this matter. The possible presence or not on Earth of extraterrestrial intelligent life forms would be a revelation that would closely affect the life of every individual. The upheaval that our knowledge and daily life could undergo makes the ufological matter a very current topic and more than worthy of decisive study. Today it is commonplace even during a simple conversation, to meet people and hear evidence of a sighting. But perhaps it is still too early for anyone to take responsibility for giving a detailed and credible answer. After all, a sense of fear of change is inherent in both history and the nature of humanity. Many of the most important scientific discoveries in history have been rejected and discredited for this very reason although fortunately, the truth always finds a way to emerge. Surely, to date, something is not right. Testimonies of this kind are growing exponentially and the behavior of the military and governments is anything but transparent. If these sightings had an explanation, there is no reason to keep it under wraps. The number of sightings suggests that what is seen has no qualms about being seen. By now, people who testify that they have seen something among the stars are the order of the day. What is the reason for all this secrecy? The facts are there for all to see. In Phoenix, over 13,000 people saw something incredible with their own eyes, as well as in Brussels, in Florence, in Sweden, in Tehran, in every part of the world. And anyone who looks into the starry sky as often as a dreamer does will sooner or later notice something unusual. It's difficult and sometimes scary to believe that other life forms are so much more technologically advanced than we are, but at this point we cannot pretend to be blind to these facts. We cannot turn a blind eye to events that seem to portend a drastic change in life and the universe as we know it. Theories are no longer enough. There is a need for clarity and an investigation that gives transparent results that can be used by anyone. The fate of the entire human race could change significantly depending on the discoveries that a UFO institution could obtain. Space travel, medicine, science, culture, art. Contact with one or more intelligent species could mean a new discovery of America for our species. When Christopher Columbus wanted to find a new way to the Indies, he was marginalized and considered a madman until someone gave him the confidence and the necessary means to follow his theory and the impact this had on all of humanity was incalculable. An encounter with one or more extraterrestrial races could probably have the same impact. 
we could acquire the knowledge to solve the most pressing problems our species is facing. Overcrowding, scarcity of natural resources, pollution and disease could all be solved thanks to superior knowledge in technology and science. But in ufological matters, there seems to be a deliberate intention to remain in ignorance. After all, curiosity, our hunger for knowledge, exploration, our need to know, are what have led humanity to be what it is today. In the name of progress, we have always been willing to sacrifice everything. But in this case, there seems to be something different, something that slows down the spirit and the hunger for knowledge that distinguishes our species. Maybe somebody has the information that can explain the reason why it would not be wise to investigate these phenomena. But it is not clear whether these reasons exist and why they should be kept hidden. The fact that in the face of such obvious events, no one comes forward to give a real exhaustive explanation could perhaps mean that governments prefer to prove themselves clearly unreliable and inconsistent rather than reveal classified information, even if we must consider the possibility that these governments are actually as ignorant as we are of the events, but in this case, even more so, not investing in studies on ufology and trying to understand what manifestations of unidentified flying objects, sometimes even threatening, are due to, seems at least an irresponsible attitude. What is certain is the silence. A veil of silence that seems conspiratorial falls on obvious facts. In Phoenix, unnatural lights appear in the sky that are seen by a large part of the population, and this fact is progressively diminished. Vague explanations follow. The lights were initially due to military aircraft in formation, then to a series of long-lasting flares that were launched by four military aircraft. Even if the times, shape and trajectory of these exercises do not coincide with this explanation, it is still taken for granted. When in Florence, strange irregular sleet rains down from the sky, an event so striking and shocking as to force the suspension of a sporting match under the eyes of tens of thousands of people, the fact is attributed to ballooning, a migration technique used by some spiders. Through their glands, they create whitish filaments with which they form a sort of net, which is then used as a parachute. But if that really were the explanation, it is not clear why the phenomenon has not happened other times, before or after, over the years. And even if it had been an exceptional case, it does not explain the fact that the day on which the event occurred does not coincide in any way with the period in which the aforementioned spiders should migrate. When the Brussels lights are seen moving in formation, with a synchrony impossible for any man-made vehicle at a speed that the human body cannot even sustain, the cause is attributed to helicopters, seen from a particular perspective. Every mass sighting, every sensational testimony is denied and ridiculed with inadequate explanations that only give rise to further questions. But if there is an explanation, it is not made public. These are just some of the most striking mass sightings to which implausible explanations have been given, which are, objectively, completely flawed. But in reality, there are many others. There are even situations in which, not only do the explanations given by official institutions appear weak, superficial and insufficient, but, if they were taken and compared to other well-documented sightings, would demonstrate common points which would sweep away any doubts about the possibility that the event is independent from the others, and would create the conditions for an accurate and perhaps fruitful investigation. November the 2nd, 1963. It is a quiet evening in the police station in Leverland, Texas, where Agent A.J. Fowler is quietly doing his paperwork. At 11 p.m. he receives a very particular phone call, a phone call that will be only the first of many other equally particular ones, 
and which will lead the agent to become alarmed to the point of forcing him to start taking all of the reports seriously. When he picks up the phone, an incredulous voice answers from the other end, the voice of Pedro Salcedo. The man sounds embarrassed, but scared at the same time. He knows what he saw, but he can't believe it. And maybe he really wouldn't believe it, were it not that his colleague, Joe Salas, also witnessed the same event. The two men are agricultural workers, who were returning home with their truck when about six kilometers from Leverland, a blue flash lit up the sky, catching their attention. Suddenly, as if in response to that light, the truck stops working. The rest of the event happens in a few endless seconds. A rocket-shaped object shoots out of the light and approaches the car with the two men inside. Mr. Salcedo, incredulous and terrified, jumps out of the truck, while his colleague, Salas, remains paralyzed in the passenger seat. An infinite instant of hesitation and the rocket shoots away, giving off a gust of wind, which makes the truck tremble. Once the object disappears over the horizon, the truck starts up again, as if nothing had happened. The agent listens to this story, a story so absurd that he can't believe it, so he ignores the call, thinking it's a joke, and resumes his paperwork, snorting. An hour later, around midnight, the phone rings again. The agent jumps and a shiver runs down his back. He shakes himself and picks up the phone. For an instant, when he hears Jim Wheeler's voice on the other end of the phone, he feels like he's experiencing deja vu. The man is almost in a state of shock after witnessing something that the policeman cannot believe. Mr. Wheeler says that while driving about four miles from Leverland, in the darkness of the road in front of him, he saw a strange oval-shaped object in the middle of the highway. Immediately after the sighting, about 60 meters away from that object, his car suddenly stopped working. The motorist, concerned, got out of the vehicle, but the moment his feet touched the asphalt, the object rose into the air and swiftly flew off into the night. As it did so, the vehicle started working again. Agent Fowler is confused, ends the call and tries to figure out what's going on, but he doesn't have the time. Just five minutes later, the phone rings again, and this time the policeman has a bad feeling. A feeling that something sinister is going on around Leverland that night. A feeling that this will just be the beginning of an evening he will never forget. When he picks up the phone, Jose Alvarez answers, stating that 18 kilometers from Leverland, while he was driving in his car, he noticed a strange luminous object at the side of the road. This time, Fowler doesn't need to hear the rest of the story to know what happened. The car had suddenly stopped working, only to start again once the strange luminous object had risen into the sky and disappeared. From that moment on, the phone goes crazy. At a quarter past midnight, it's the turn of a farmer, Frank Williams. The story is the same. He was driving near Leverland. He noticed a strange luminous object at the side of the road. His car stopped working, the object flew away, and the car started up again. Then a certain James Long calls, a truck driver traveling to the city. Fowler listens to yet another shocked voice, telling the same story over again. That night, Fowler will hear the same exact story 15 times. Every detail is so similar that Agent Fowler, shocked and incredulous, can't help but take the reports seriously, without being able to do anything. The following day, others will come forward, confirming all the witness accounts of the previous night. The events of Leverland were so striking that the Air Force had to open an official investigation, even going so far as to question some of the witnesses. The verdict was that these events had been caused by severe thunderstorms in the area. Thunderstorms that they said could have explained the electrical faults in the vehicles. 
At the same time, testimonies such as Salcedo's were not taken into consideration due to his apparently low level of education. But various ufologists and experts openly disputed this explanation. The Air Force's theory, in fact, revolved around the hypothesis that the sightings were the result of a specific atmospheric phenomenon, St. Elmo's fire. St. Elmo's fire consists in luminescent discharges caused by the ionization of the air during a storm. In practice, they are similar to lightning, but have a wider range. The main detractors of this theory, James MacDonald and Josef Allen Hynek, maintained that not only had the storm now passed, but there is no proven correlation between the phenomenon of St. Elmo's fire and automobile engines cutting out. However, even if we accept these explanations without further questioning, there remains a fact, not considered at the time, which, if correlated with this event and the subsequent sightings in Tehran, leaves us with enormous perplexities. How can one ignore that these events are connected? It certainly cannot be said that the same series of, to say the least, improbable coincidences that would have taken place in Leverland could also have taken place in Tehran, in completely different circumstances. Then there are the cases in which the situations that are presumed to have arisen, because the witnesses of sightings of unidentified flying objects had been mistaken, are statistically on the verge of the impossible. August the 5th, 1953. In Black Hawk, Mrs. Kellyan is observing the starry horizon when she suddenly notices something unusual in the sky. It is five past eight and the evening is passing peacefully at the nearby Ellsworth military base. The phone rings like a bolt from the blue foretelling a storm. The caller is Mrs. Kellyan, who claims to have seen a bright red light in the sky, initially stationary, which had abruptly moved to the right and then returned to its original position. The soldier who answered the phone, alarmed, sends three colleagues to check the perimeter of the building. They confirm the presence of a light, placing it in a northeasterly direction. At that point, the radar of the base detects the actual presence of something in the same direction reported by the soldiers. An F-84 is immediately alerted and takes off towards the coordinates communicated. On the plane's radar, the object appears to be 5 kilometers away, but as soon as the pilot manages to make eye contact, something inexplicable happens. The object shoots off leaving the pilot time to snatch only a few fleeting photographs. As the plane returns to base, however, the object reappears in the same initial position. Lieutenant Needham, a veteran pilot of World War II and the Korean War, has heard everything that has happened and is so incredulous that he asks permission to investigate firsthand. Receiving permission, he takes off and heads towards the unidentified flying object. Initially, when he gets close to the sighting, he thinks it's a reflection, but when he notices movement in the foreground against the background of three fixed stars, he becomes convinced that it can't be. Again, upon getting closer, the object disappears, this time permanently. In the meantime, an attempt is made at the base to analyze the photographs taken by the first pilot. But it is useless. Near that light, the camera had malfunctioned. Apparently, just like in Tehran and Leverland, approaching these unknown objects interfered with electronic equipment. The explanation given to this event is far from simple, so much so, in the eyes of many, it appears to be a considerable stretch of the imagination. The conclusions that the military would have reached are in fact complex, and justified only by an intricate series of coincidences, bordering on the impossible. According to the investigation, the red light initially seen by Mrs. Kellyan would have been the signal light of a radio station's antenna. The three soldiers sent to check outside the building would have seen a meteorite. The first pilot would have seen a reflection of the star Pollux, 
while Lieutenant Needham would have seen another reflection, this time of the star Mirfak. Both reflections were allegedly caused by particular weather conditions. As for the radar detections, instead they would be caused by unusual atmospheric conditions, while with respect to the camera malfunction, no one investigated further, as if it were another small piece in a huge puzzle of coincidences. All this has left many experts and ufologists who have studied the matter not a little perplexed. Though, based on our knowledge, it may seem impossible that an extraterrestrial race has arrived on our planet, the series of coincidences that would explain this incident it must be admitted, seems at least equally impossible. But what most have overlooked in this absurd story is precisely the malfunction of the electronic equipment that would correlate this event with those of Tehran and Leverland. But these three are not the only ones. July the 9th, 1965, the Azores, Portugal. Something unusual happens at the Santa Maria airport. To the amazement of those present, a cylindrical aircraft flies over the airport, causing the electronic equipment to go haywire. This is an extract from the local newspaper, which reported the incident. An airport spokesman, Saturday, said a mysterious flying object apparently stopped all electromagnetic watches at the Santa Maria airport when it flew slowly over this island on Friday. He said a white cylindrical object was seen flying northwest at an altitude of 33,000 feet and attempts to identify it were unsuccessful. Once again, an unidentified cylindrical flying object causes electronic equipment to malfunction. At this point, it is necessary to question and investigate thoroughly to understand how these events are related. The sightings in question have too many things in common for them to be ignored as a whole and just analysed individually, as, up until now, has been done. When it comes to ufology, in modern times, differences must be set aside. The sightings in question affect the entire planet and not just individual states. If concrete results are to be obtained, it is necessary to create an institution that stands above state policies and that can coordinate rigorous research conducted on a planetary level. Mass alien sightings, it must be said, are often inexplicable events. This is due to our limited knowledge, which can give rise to misinterpretations. But wanting to give a rational explanation at all costs while being aware of the impossibility of doing so is a deleterious attitude that will never lead to real growth nor a widening of our knowledge. In antiquity, if we go back to the remotest periods of human history up to prehistoric times, we can see that man has always tried to give an answer to phenomena which, due to insufficient knowledge, he could not explain. Once, Prehistoric men would observe the sky, seeing incredible spectacles such as lightning, and became convinced that an angry deity was behind those phenomena. Perhaps in the starry sky resides that sense of wonder and childish curiosity that has led man to evolve and seek answers to ancestral questions. The moon, stars, clouds, lightning and rain. Today we know what all these phenomena are, and we take the explanation for granted. But if there is one thing that man has always been guilty of, it is haste, the urgent need to find an answer. Although history teaches us that only with patience and analysis can the unequivocally right answers be found, still today, as soon as something happens that escapes our knowledge, we settle for the most improbable solutions a cyclical trap into which we continue to fall, like naive children obsessed with a curiosity, which, albeit genuine, deceives us, leading us to misguided conclusions, taken at face value only because a more irrational explanation seems impossible to us. If we talk about history, 
in particular the most ancient, paleo-ufology, which we have already mentioned, helps us once again with respect to this kind of reflection. That branch of ufology that analyzes the testimonies, purely written or figurative, of the presence of extraterrestrial life forms as visitors to our planet. In fact, if we rely on the well-documented studies of ufological experts, we can easily understand that already in ancient times, man was aware that a technologically advanced being presided over the skies. Take for example one of the oldest testimonies, the 10,000-year-old rock paintings found in a cave in the Charama region of Kanka district in the tribal region of Bastar, India, by Indian archaeologist J. R. Bhagat. The paintings seem to depict beings from another planet. The findings suggest that humans in prehistoric times may have seen or imagined beings from other planets, which still creates curiosity among people and researchers today. Extensive research is needed for further discoveries. Chhattisgarh does not currently have any experts who can shed light on the matter, the archaeologist told the Times of India. It would seem, therefore, that already in the most ancient of times, our ancestors had to deal with civilizations from another planet. Unfortunately, the type of relationship that many of those times had established with these presumed visitors is unknown. However, going fast forward in time, we have other finds that can help us understand how the relationship between humans and these unknown civilizations evolved. There are numerous illustrations, sculptures and written testimonies, some even contained in the Old Testament, which would attest to a close relationship between the most ancient civilizations and an extraterrestrial race. From the evidence we have, in fact, we can understand that not only were our ancestors aware of the existence of this extraterrestrial race, not only that they even lived in close contact with these beings, but also that they were considered divinities to all intents and purposes. This could demonstrate how our knowledge in the field of ufology, instead of progressing, has progressively regressed, leading us today to a ruthless scepticism. When it comes to aliens, what we are doing, discrediting the theories of the presence of extraterrestrial races, is not so different from what past societies, like that of the Sumerians, did, which seem to have idealized these technologically much more advanced civilizations by elevating them to gods. The only difference is that today, perhaps due to a greater pride and a sense of absolute superiority and arrogance, we cannot accept that there is a civilization that has outclassed us from a scientific or technological point of view. So if they were once gods, in our desecrating contemporary society, their existence is not even admitted, and what happens before our eyes is ignored and is classified as fairy tales, or urban legends. All we have today is information scattered across the web by individual citizens who refuse to be marginalized and ridiculed. Subjects individually try to put together the pieces of a mosaic which is much larger than themselves. Driven by the insatiable curiosity of those who want to get to the truth at all costs. Normal people who cannot accept approximate answers and try to unite as best they can to work together and finally find a satisfactory solution to these questions. But if any legacy of the past is considered unusable as evidence, if every testimony of individuals is discredited and disassembled by any means, if absurd hypotheses are preferred to rational deductions, Mass sightings remain the only means of demonstrating to the human race its own blindness. The Night of the Phoenix Lights is an event that cannot be speculated about, especially if it is linked to other similar sightings. The strange snow that fell on Florence on October the 27th, 1954 is an established fact, and there are numerous elements of proof of what happened, as well as the memories of thousands of people, and everyone is aware that the explanation provided is not tenable. 
There are too many gaps and too many commonalities in different groups and types of sightings for skeptics to still try to give an explanation based on the insufficient knowledge we have. Of course, it must be admitted that there have been false reports and false witness accounts. There definitely are people who take advantage of the phenomenon of unidentified flying objects to experience brief moments of fame, to attract attention. But this cannot divert attention from all the other valid testimonies that deserve further study. Certainly, at times, Atmospheric phenomena or particular meteorological conditions have caused involuntary errors by people who, albeit in good faith, have confused rare and incredible natural events with alien sightings, but for this reason not all reports should be interpreted as false. It is necessary to understand which sightings should be discarded for one or another reason, and to separate these errors or misunderstandings from those real events that require more specific analysis. Only in this way can ufology be transformed into a field of research that is as exact as possible, so that the phenomenon of unidentified flying objects can be studied with the seriousness it deserves, and finally, over time, it will be able to reach a real and definitive conclusion. Having a closed and oppressive attitude is certainly not the most appropriate solution to deal with the problem. The media circus and humiliation which ufological experts are sometimes subjected to is often due not only to widespread ignorance but also to the fact that these same experts are often forced to formulate their theories without adequate tools. Tools that could bring information and evidence to support their thesis. There may be some experts who exploit the theme of ufology to gain notoriety, but one cannot therefore think that every student of unidentified flying objects is a charlatan. Often those who report the sightings are more than respectable people who have gained nothing by telling the truth, except a series of rude and negative names ranging from mythomaniac to crazy. It is enough to listen to Lieutenant Jafari's statement to understand that we are dealing with a serious person, a person who carries with him real concern for what he evidently saw with his own eyes. His furrowed brow, his rigid and rigorous bearing and his calm and authoritative voice leave no room for lies or trifles. It is enough to see him recounting what he witnessed firsthand to convince us that the man is not lying. He has not had a vision and he just wants somebody to clarify what unequivocally happened. Like Lieutenant Jafari, like Tim Lay's family from Phoenix, like the fans of Florence, like the children who designed the alien vehicle at Haven Broad in 1977, like Agent Fowler and the various witnesses of the Leverland case, lots of people actually saw something unexplainable. Lights in the sky, unidentified flying objects in the shape of a cigar or emitting flashing lights, moving at speeds impossible for us humans and separating in different directions, malfunctions of electronic equipment due to proximity with previously unseen aircraft. All of this cannot be the result of fantasy or delirium. All of this cannot be forgotten or underestimated. One cannot continually resort to wild hypotheses, such as the psychosocial theory of UFOs. More than 2,000 years ago, General Timoleon left us a fundamental testimony that discredits the thesis of mass suggestion as regards a whole series of sightings that have more than a few elements in common with each other. It is practically impossible that starting from the cave paintings of prehistoric times to the ancient civilizations of Mesopotamia, South America and Asia, passing through the ancient Greeks and Romans, then the Middle Ages and the past centuries up to today, 
all the information and sightings are a figment of the imagination of some particularly suggestible subject. How would it be possible that the entire history of humanity was dotted with evidence of sightings and contacts with an extraterrestrial civilization if this or these civilizations did not exist? Mass alien sightings have been reported throughout history and continue to be a source of fascination for many. Ufology has become an increasingly popular field of research as more and more people are interested in the possibility of alien life. For this reason, to date, the information we have seems to be sufficient to bring studies of the subject to a higher level, and therefore to deeper and more precise insights and research. The number of reported alien sightings has grown exponentially in recent years. Many people claim to have seen strange objects in the sky or even encountered extraterrestrial beings. While some of these reports are likely to be hoaxes or misidentifications, there is still a lot of mystery surrounding these sightings and what they could mean for our understanding of life beyond Earth. The debate surrounding mass alien sightings has been a long and ever-evolving one. While several theories have been put forward to explain these strange events, the truth remains elusive. Despite numerous advances in technology and science, we still find ourselves without concrete answers. Ultimately, only time and further research will tell us what is really behind these mysterious sightings. Meanwhile, it is clear that mass alien sightings remain of great interest to many. For some, it is a matter of intrigue and fascination. For others, it is a deep source of fear and uncertainty. Aliens, real or imagined, have the ability to captivate the minds of millions, so the mystery of mass alien sightings is unlikely to be solved anytime soon. Nonetheless, progress is being made. Finally, it seems that modern society is shaking off the bigotry of the past and is progressing, united, towards a real answer. A positive signal in this field was given by the SETI project, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, more commonly known as SETI, is the ongoing effort to detect signals from intelligent extraterrestrial species. The project was designed by scientists to search for evidence of intelligent life beyond Earth. The SETI project uses radio and optical telescopes in an attempt to pick up any kind of signal from a distant star system with the hope of finding signs of extraterrestrial intelligence. Surely this cannot be considered sufficient and does not in any way resolve the doubts, perplexities and questions related to mass alien sightings. However, it can certainly be considered a first step towards the establishment of an official institution that performs a constant and rigorous study of ufology. Perhaps, after all the millennia spent exploring this planet, the history of humanity is about to change. Perhaps we are on the verge of an epochal turning point. Finally, after having contemplated the starry sky and fantasized about its mysteries for thousands of years, the answer could come from the heavens themselves. <laughs>